Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. In the legislative building in Regina today, we will have Premier Mo and Dr. Shahab. Joining us over the line, we have Scott Livingstone, CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority, and Dr. Rashad Hansia, spelling first name R-A-S-H-A-D, last name H-A-N-S-I-A. Uh, Dr. Hansia is the uh, physician, executive integrated urban health uh, with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, today, Premier Mo will have an opening statement along with an opening statement from Dr. Shahab and Mr. Livingstone will have a statement on the resumption of services in the Saskatchewan Health Authority. This is a two minute warning. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. In the Legislative Building in Regina, we have Premier Scott Moe and Dr. Saqib Shahab. Joining us over the line uh, is Scott Livingstone, CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority, and Dr. Rashad Hansia, uh, Director of Physician Executive Integrated H Urban Health with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, Premier Moe, Dr. Shahab, and Mr. Livingstone will have opening comments followed by questions. Premier. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope everyone had the opportunity to have an enjoyable long weekend. Today we are reporting seven additional cases as well as 15 more recoveries. The number of new cases remained low throughout the long weekend and the number of recoveries continued to increase throughout the weekend. Over the past four days, including today, there were just nine new cases reported and 62 additional recoveries. Reducing the number of known cases in Saskatchewan to 123 active cases. This is good news, as today we begin phase two of the reopened Saskatchewan plan. This is a much larger phase than phase one. A significant number of Saskatchewan businesses will reopen today and a significant number of Saskatchewan people will have the opportunity to return to work. And I know many Saskatchewan people are looking forward to getting a haircut, and I count myself among one of them or maybe visiting their favorite clothing store to pick up a new shirt or, or a new cardigan, possibly. I expect that demand for cardigans has gone up substantially in this province over the course of the past few weeks, and for good reason. In addition to hair salons and clothing stores, there will be shoe stores, flower shops, sporting goods stores, gift shops, bookstores, toy stores, jewelry stores, electronic stores, pawn shops, and, and many other opportunities for businesses to reopen today and of course, each and every one of those businesses, their employees and their customers must continue to follow the safe physical distancing practices 
that have worked so well to date. As Dr. Shahab said last week, COVID has not gone away. It may appear to hide for a short while, but the threat continues and it remains. So thanks to all of you. We have, seen, we have been successful to date in controlling the spread of COVID-19. But as we move into the next phase of reopening, we all have a responsibility to continue the good practices that have gotten us this far. And I'm confident that that will happen and that we can continue to safely and successfully reopen our province of Saskatchewan and given Saskatchewan people the opportunity to return to work. Also today, the Saskatchewan Health Authority will begin to resume some of the procedures and services that were paused to ensure that we had the capacity to deal with this pandemic. These include outpatient physiotherapist appointments, kidney health services, and some lab services, some home care services, as well as expanded immunizations. Like the rest of the reopening plan, the Saskatchewan Health Authority will continue to gradually expand other services in the days ahead, while continuing to carefully monitor the case numbers and our health care system capacity. And Scott Livingston will have a bit more to say about that in just a few moments. Also, starting tomorrow, we are lifting the one-month supply limit on prescription drugs. This temporary limit was put in place on March the 18th to prevent shortages and to ensure the continued supply of prescription medications during the pandemic. We are now confident that this limit can be lifted without jeopardizing the supply of prescription drugs. The situation in and around the Lalash, uh, community of Lalash continues to improve. There are still 107 active cases in the far north and virtually all of those cases are in the northwestern portion of our province. So following consultation with a number of leaders in communities further to the east of that area, but also in Saskatchewan's north, the travel restrictions for the north central and the, the northeastern part of the province, including the communities of La Ronge, Air Ronge, Pelican Narrows and Sandy Bay are being lifted. And for now, the travel restrictions will remain in place for the Northwest, including Laloche, Beauvel, Buffalo Narrows, Isla Cross, and Pine House. Community leaders and volunteers, healthcare workers, public safety officers, and many others, they continue to do a great job in Laloche and, and in many other Northern communities as they work together to control the spread of COVID-19. We hope to be able to safely lift the travel restrictions in those communities as well in the not too distant future. Finally today, I once again want to express our province's deep condolences to the Snowbirds family and to the family and friends of, of Captain Jen Casey. Just a few days ago, so many Saskatchewan people enjoyed the chance to watch the Snowbirds fly over a number of communities, including this building here in our, in our province's capital but throughout the province as part of their cross Canada tour. And all of us were most certainly shocked and saddened to see that tour end in tragedy in Kamloops. Saskatchewan officer offers our most sincere condolences to Captain Casey's family and our hope for a full recovery to Captain Richard McDougall. I would also take this opportunity to thank our, our volunteer and our local fire fire persons on the ground uh, in north of Prince Albert in the Fort Alicorn area where they are uh, doing a, a, a large amount of work alongside our public safety agency, our provincial public safety agency in battling a blaze uh, in that particular area. So thank you uh, for what you are doing uh, each and every day uh, throughout this weekend. So I'll now turn it over to Dr. Shahab for a few comments and then start Scott Livingston. I believe you have a few comments as well. Thank you, Premier. So just want to re-emphasize that, that as we now cautiously start phase two, um, it, it's really important just to keep some uh, some principles in mind. Uh, I think we just just like when grocery stores were um, were open, you know, there was some uh, good information that was given out in terms of you know try to go at times when the crowding is less. Everyone shouldn't really try to go at the same time. And the same principle should apply with malls and uh, other businesses as they open. I understand uh, the process for um, hair salons and other uh, businesses. There's an appointment system in place, and uh, the waiting times may be long. But you know, I think that we all need some patience with that. Uh, with malls and other shops, again, like we discussed earlier, 
uh, it's really important to go and uh, get what you want, um, not browse or uh, you know try out a lot of things. It, it's very hard for businesses then to have to restock everything, minimize returns as well as much as you can. Uh, malls as well, uh, as we know in some provinces, uh, stores with street funds have opened at malls or not. We, you know, we've decided to go ahead with shopping malls uh, at the same time as other retail businesses, but it still means that all the food courts are open, uh, the seating areas are not, and so if you do uh, get uh, uh, food from the food courts, you, you should really take that home, not sit at other areas or try to uh, consume the, while there. And similarly, uh, you know, historically malls are a place to hang out, but this is really not the time to loiter or go as a group there to socialize. It's better to go out and walk while keep maintaining that physical distance and go to the malls ready to uh, shop uh, for what you need and support businesses in that way. Uh, and obviously comply with whatever direction is given to minimize crowding in those settings as well. Um, the the uh, um, Northern travel order has been amended, as the Premier mentioned. And this again shows how uh, things can change based on um, uh, um, uh, information around outbreaks. And in this case, the order is now limited to the Northwest only. Um, and as time goes by, obviously, we hope that will also uh, be rescinded. Uh, and again, we ha have to recognize that the, you know these kind of steps may be required anywhere in the province if we see a cluster or an outbreak. And, and uh, it is hard for communities when something like this happens. But again, uh, we can see that once it's applied, you, know, you, you can get ahead of the outbreak along with all the other inputs that are required, which include uh, staying in your home if there's an outbreak, um, you know, uh, testing and case content investigations. And finally, um, you know, in terms of testing, again, you know, uh, we are seeing a, a bit of an increase in testing. We really hope that people will continue to seek testing for any symptoms over the next few months. And if people have concerns as they're out and about and are reopening businesses, you know, the testing capacity is uh, available in Saskatchewan. And even for mild symptoms, you, you can seek testing. Or if you have any concerns, you can seek advice in terms of uh, concerns you may have or your, uh, or your employees may have. Uh, and again, as we uh, re uh, engage in this phase two of reopen Saskatchewan, maintaining the physical distance while we're out and about, uh, either uh, enjoying the outdoor weather or uh, while shopping or, or going to work is really important. Thank you. We now have an opening comment from uh, SHA CEO Scott Livingstone on the phased uh, resumption of procedures and services. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to start by thanking healthcare workers across the province for the work they do each and every day, and in particular as we enter this reopened phase of our healthcare system and service resumption. I'm proud of the work they're doing each and every day to ensure that we're providing safe, high-quality care to the people in the province. Today, as we slowly and cautiously uh, our system becomes resuming uh, re resume services for everyday health care services in the province. These plans will look a little different depending upon where you may live in the province, but here are some examples of what you're going to see over the next coming weeks. See an increase in primary health care services, including those services for chronic disease management like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or heart disease, diabetes. Increased home care supports, outpatient therapy appointments, and expanded immunizations. We will also see surgical services slowly increasing to accommodate more patients who have been on our waiting list, as well as lab services and diagnostic imaging are also slowly, slowly expanding their volumes as well. You'll see an increase in mental health, face-to-face -face services, as well as kidney health services, and students that are pursuing healthcare careers will also see their placements rescheduled. While we know that some parts of the province are still experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks, we also know that there are several people across this province that are needing these services <clears throat> that have been on hold for a number of weeks. During the first phase of resumption, we plan on balancing both sides of the equation by being both flexible and adaptive, and, and we will not move further to expand services until we're confident that we can safely take care of patients at the same time of managing COVID response. I need to stress that just because some of the services are opening, we are in no way going back to normal, and we are a long way from our normal uh, volumes in healthcare, and we will continue to monitor expand as we can do that safely over the upcoming weeks. The public can expect that their healthcare experience is going to look different than it was prior to the pandemic because of the additional measures that we'll have to put in place to protect both patients and staff. 
In most locations, this will include adaptations of our waiting room practices to promote physical distancing, additional emphasis on virtual care whenever possible, as well as screening uh, at all of our healthcare facilities. The SHA is asking for people's patience as these practices are necessary for safety reasons, but they may cause some delays and inconveniences for patients as we start getting into this new routine of normal monitoring for COVID as we expand services. I'd also like to remind the public that visiting restrictions are still in place at our facilities, which include long-term care homes. On behalf of our healthcare teams, I'd like to thank you for your patience and cooperation as we work through these changes together and make every effort to provide the very best healthcare we can for Saskatchewan residents. Thank you. Thank you, and we now have time for questions. We'll take our first question from the room, Arthur. Um, so we, we've been hearing from phase three businesses, Mr. Premier, that, that, that it may take a substantial length of time to prepare for reopening. Um, you know, they may have to reorient kitchens, put proper physical distancing plans into place, train some of their staff. What can you tell them about when phase three will come to allow them to make those preparations? Do you have a specific date in mind? Can you tell us what it is or at least give us something that allows them to prepare? You're exactly right. There are many of the, Dr. Schaub, you may have something to add here as well, but there's a number of businesses that, um, you know, may have to change a little bit or essentially how they are operating. And I think in fairness, what we have seen with the businesses that have opened, remained open throughout uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and have, have now opened today or, or opened in, uh, in phase one, uh, have had to change how they're operating. So for sure, phase three businesses uh, will have to change uh, in many ways how they're operating. Most notable among them is the large number of restaurants in, in communities uh, right across this province. Um, with respect to phase three, I think what you could expect in the very near future, understanding the um, just that, that they businesses do need some lead time and some ramp up time, if you will, that we will move forward with uh, setting a target date uh, for opening. And we need to continue to monitor uh, the numbers of infections. Uh, we're in a very critical stage as we are opening up phase two uh, here today. I am confident in Saskatchewan people that we will be able to uh, continue to flatten uh, the COVID-19 infection curve uh, here in the province, um, but it's necessary uh, for us uh, to be very um, vigilant in our, in our personal uh, uh, physical distancing measures in order for that to happen. So we, what we will be looking at in the days ahead is to uh, start to rough out a target date, if you will, so that these businesses will have a date that they can start to um, plan for. And then we will uh, watch the numbers in the, in the weeks ahead so that we are, you know, able to adjust that target date if necessary. Um, but the hope would be that we wouldn't have to adjust that target date. Anything to add, doctor? I would just say it's always good to have two to three weeks, minimum two weeks, but up to three weeks in between phases and maybe longer. And I think we just need to, um, you know, let phase two reopen and then start planning for phase three. Follow up, Arthur? Phase two is a substantial reopening with most of our retail businesses opening. And uh, we've shown uh, that retail businesses can operate and operate safely throughout this in the grocery stores. Uh, uh, and others that were open throughout. And, but today's a, a, a big day and uh, we have every confidence that employers, customers uh, and employees are uh, going to take uh, this very seriously. For the kind of lucid, for, for, for the uh, changes to the travel restrictions in the northern, uh, in the, uh, in the northern administration district, um, you talked about consultation leading to those decisions about which areas would be included and which would not. But I just talked to the mayor of La Ronge and, and he hadn't heard about this as of 2 p.m. today. So I'm just wondering what that says about the state of those consultations and what you would say to concerns in that community that this could lead to a rush of people from the south returning to cottages, entering that community to get away. I would suspect there will be people uh, that will go not only to the community of LaRange but other communities as well as you'll see people in those communities uh, that will uh, come uh, south to, to southern communities as well. The road, the road travels uh, both ways. I mean, I can't speak uh, specifically to uh, the mayor of LaRange uh, but I can speak to the mayors in general that the minister, uh, Lori Carr, has been uh, conducting uh, uh, frequent, uh, at least weekly or 
usually more so uh, calls with all of the northern mayors. Uh, more often in particular with the mayors uh, throughout the northwest is uh, we have uh, really centered in the fact that the, the, the predominant majority, the vast majority of our of our COVID positive cases in the Northern Administration District are in that Northwest. Uh, it's always our goal to remove restrictions, not add them. Uh, we will add them when necessary, um, but it is our goal to remove restrictions so that we can operate as close to um, what will be a new normal as possible. Uh, so I, I can't speak specifically uh, to any individual mayor outside of that. I know the minister has had regular um, conference calls with leaders in, in all Northern communities uh, whether they be Indigenous or, or, or non-Indigenous. We'll take our next question from the phone line, operator. We have Ryan Kessler with Global. Yes, uh, Premier, the province hasn't seen more than 1,000 tests per day since April 9th. Are those numbers expected to increase now that we're in Phase 2? Um, I, I the testing capacity that we have, uh, when we do have the capacity now, uh, just not only through the Roy Romano lab, but also with our uh, rapid access tests, our gen expert tests uh, that we have to go uh, beyond uh, even 1,500 uh, if necessary. Uh, the fact that we haven't had uh, those high of numbers is, is, as I've said, is somewhat of a positive, is, is there just aren't people that are presenting uh, with a symptom. Uh, that is why we have expanded um, some of our, our testing uh, criteria, and Scott, you may, uh, or doctor, you may want to uh, speak uh, to that uh, again. Um, but as we move forward, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it, it, and it, it, this is a good time for us to uh, just step back a couple of months as to you, you, what our original intent and what our goal was it was to flatten the curve. It wasn't to eradicate uh, COVID-19. It's to flatten the curve so that our healthcare system uh, can manage uh, any of the challenges that may come at it. As we have seen in other areas of North America and around the world, uh, when this uh, virus is allowed to spread and, and to spread uh, without, without check, uh, it, it can prove to be very serious. Uh, it can be proved to be very, very serious uh, for those elderly, uh, those elderly uh, individuals in our community and in particular uh, quite often in long-term care homes. So uh, the goal has never been to eradicate COVID-19. It has been to flatten the curve until such point that we'd have access uh, to a vaccine. So in the days ahead, why I say that, in the days ahead, um, the numbers that we had this past weekend um, may not be what we will see in the days ahead. We may see some higher numbers as we reopen our economy and start to uh, get out and about a little bit more than possibly we have over the course of the last month or six weeks. So, um, but that shouldn't frighten uh, anyone. Um, that is part of the new normal. That is part of, of now living until such time there is a vaccine uh, that is available to us. That is part of living with, with COVID-19 is we are going to have uh, its presence and that is why we need to continue to be so very diligent. Um, we have proven uh, over the course of the last two months that we can, um, we, we can stop the spread of, of this virus when even with many businesses open as we have had about half a million people uh, in this province that have been working throughout this pandemic, um, but we have continued to, to flatten the curve and, and to really uh, drive our, our infection rate down. We have done that uh, through our, our very, very vigilant personal efforts around, around physical distancing and ensuring that uh, we are adhering to the health orders and the health recommendations that have put for, been put forward uh, by Dr. Shahab. So we can do this in the months ahead, and I would say uh, that we must do this in the months ahead, and I know that we will do this in the months ahead. Doctor, anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the test positive rate because that's an indicator that we track very closely. And so overall, our test positive rate has never gone up above 3%, and currently it's at 1.4%. So that's really a, a good sign that even though our testing numbers have come down, the proportion that tests positive is very low, 1.4%, and in central parts of the province is 0.4, south rural 0.4, Regina 0.8, Saskatoon 1.1. In Saskatoon and Regina, when, uh, as we mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, when they had more activity, the test positive rate, rate did creep up to around 3 4%, but then has come down. Uh, it's 1.3 in the uh, in the north, uh, and that was because of the recent outbreak was coming down. In the far north, obviously, in the northwest, it's uh, higher, around 8.5%, but hopefully that will settle down as well. So I think it's we look at the testing numbers, we look at the test positive rate, 
If the test positive rate is also low, that's reassuring that there's very little virus transmission happening. Uh, but we look at a number of factors in terms of um, um, uh, who is being tested, what the testing rate is, what the test positive rate is. Um, but over time, um, as uh, the, the testing guidelines expand, we hope to maintain or increase our testing numbers that we have currently and continue to monitor closely. And we have to remember that you know we're looking at this for the medium to long term. And as uh, the fall comes, obviously, with cough scores going around, we fully expect the testing numbers to rise up again, which they should. Uh, and again, we'll be monitoring the test positive rate and other uh, factors as well at that time. Follow up, Ryan? Yeah, just given uh, the province's comfort level with the current testing rate, the fact that we're seeing some restrictions ease here and the fact that we're seeing it in other provinces as well, uh, what is the current recommendation around interprovincial travel? Has it changed at all? So, um, and, and people uh, have asked us uh, or have asked me um, uh, about that and, and through the COVID-19 email system, we've been given consistent advice. I think one thing we need to recognize is that as we reopen our economy and as we reopen our ability to enjoy the outdoors in various settings, the general principles still remain the same. Um, if you can enjoy the outdoors closer to home, if you can, um, um, uh, you know, uh, meet with one or two households or one or two friends under 10. Right now, the group size remains restricted to 10. Generally, provinces, all provinces, including Saskatchewan, we don't recommend unnecessary uh, travel uh, between provinces either. Uh, obviously, for essential uh, services, it is. Now, some of that may change as we go forward. So obviously, different provinces are at a different stage of the pandemic. But as things stabilize across Canada, that advice may change as well. Uh, but generally, I think uh, we do need to ease into uh, some of these things. And at, at the moment, you know, all the guidelines around physical distancing while you're out and about remain, staying uh, close to home while you're enjoy enjoying the outdoors remain. This is a uh, conversation that has come up, um, and I suspect will again at the First Minister's table around national testing capacity and ensuring we have the capacity to test what we may need to at times, as well as contact tracing. And, and, and we feel uh, fairly strong on our ability to contact trace here within the province, and I, I think it has proven to be successful in not only identifying uh, the people that uh, ultimately test positive with COVID-19, but identifying the, the people they've been in contact with and ensuring that they all can isolate for the required uh, period of time. That, that starts to change as we reopen our economy and understanding the the, uh, the, the travel that will increase across not only provincial borders, but ultimately uh, will begin to increase as well across international borders. And it, it is important for us to remember that throughout this pandemic, there has been essential travel across the international border as well. Uh, even uh, with that travel, bringing goods into Saskatchewan and, and some goods out, uh, we have been able to uh, flatten the curve and be very successful with our, our efforts here. Uh, but this is a conversation that we now need to work collaboratively on across the nation and ultimately as a nation, but across the nation on, on interprovincial travel, um, but as a nation as we ultimately start to increase also in, in the months ahead um, some essential uh, international travel and ensuring that we are able to trace uh, those individuals should they be required, had they been in contact with someone, uh, that we're able to trace those individuals, not only within Saskatchewan's borders, but within Canada's borders and beyond. We'll take our next question from the room here, Steph. Yeah, Mr. Premier, you say that, you know, this is a big day and this is the most substantial reopening we've seen thus far. How will you know when it is time to move to phase three? Uh, I think what we will do uh, to, to the question earlier is uh, we will discuss in the next number of days uh, setting a target date. Um, Dr. Shahab had mentioned uh, two, three, four weeks out, um, which would then allow us some time to review some of the results, uh, some of the testing results uh, that, have, that are occurring with this phase two opening, which is a, a substantial opening with the retail uh, with the retail, many of the retail stores uh, starting to open. So it'll allow us some time to, um, you know, identify what is actually happening uh, over the course of uh, at least two weeks, but also give uh, the businesses that would be part of a phase three the opportunity to start planning, start some tentative planning uh, towards a target date of, uh, of reopening their business. Understanding the 
may have some changes to make within their business. Follow up stuff? Yeah, I, I, like I just want to be clear. So three to four weeks, are, you're looking at June for a potential target date? Um, what's today? Today's nine today. Thursday. Yes, that would be sometime in June. And again, what specifically do you need to see? Like we've seen a case where there's been localized flare-ups, but you still moved ahead with phase two. Like what is the what is the bar for you? Is it no new cases, you know, 20 new cases, yeah. only cases yeah. in certain areas of the province? I, I will let Dr. Shahab speak to uh, the, the specifics around uh, what the bar might be on when you may move ahead or not move ahead. Um, but I, I think you would see a very similar approach with phase three uh, that we've seen with phase one and two where where there are um, the potential for localized outbreaks, whether they be in a, in a facility or in a community, uh, you may see us restrict or delay some of the reopening in that particular area. In, in, a, in a, you know, most unfortunate circumstance, we may actually have to pull back and, and tighten up in that, that particular facility or, or a particular area. Um, this has worked. Uh, it worked uh, in Lloydminster, we saw earlier this year. It uh, appears to be working. Uh, in the in the northwestern region of this province, there's still admittedly still some more work to do, and we thank the uh, the local leadership, as well as the provincial uh, uh, supports that are on the ground. Um, but I I would look to if there are decisions that need to be made around phase three. Uh, it's quite likely they would mirror decisions that have been made made around phase one and two, and they would be very localized in their nature uh, to address a a regional outbreak um, to ensure that it does not become a provincial outbreak. I mean, I would just add that if you look at the how the phases are structured, um, we already learned a lot from essential businesses continuing to operate, and they sent the benchmark for a lot of uh, businesses opening in phase two, which uh, are also retail environments, but are going to follow the template that was set by grocery stores and other retail environments. And similarly, in phase one, a lot of medical-oriented uh, services opened, and uh, the reason that they were in phase one was that a lot of medical-oriented services are already uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable about infection control uh, and personal protective equipment guidelines. So, and then th that is the model that a lot of other personal services in phase two uh, and then in future in phase three would have to uh, learn from. And the kind of PPE that may use, they may use may not be the same. And the clientele that they receive may be lower risk in terms of you know healthy people going for a haircut or other services. But again, I think it's a learning process for businesses and employers and employees as well as customers in terms of how do you now go and get a haircut? You know, you call ahead. There may be just one or two people in the waiting room. You cancel your appointment that you took three weeks to get if you have a cough. I think that kind of discipline we all have to learn and not go if you have a cough just because you. Uh, only got an appointment after three weeks. So I think that's the discipline we all have to practice to make each phase a safer reopening. And then phase three, obviously, there's other dynamics in terms of it's a bit different from businesses in phase two. It's not just a retail environment. It's other settings where in the past where there's been gatherings, there have been issues. So that's where I think uh, you know restaurants and other settings need to learn how to operate safely uh, with reduced um, uh, tables, for example, in restaurants and for gyms, you know, with le less number of people in order to reopen safely. And, and we also are closely monitoring research that's coming around how did transmission happen in different settings and, and applying that knowledge to guidance for uh, future phases as well. Dr. Shahab had touched on the fact that some of the uh, businesses, um, grocery stores and others that were, were able to stay open throughout this pandemic have really led the way on how to conduct retail business safely uh, with plexiglass, with uh, you know enhanced uh, cleanliness uh, standards, enhanced uh, access to uh, cleaning products such as um, uh, hand sanitizer. And those guidelines for phase three businesses are now being uh, adapted and incorporated with uh, input from uh, the actual businesses in phase three, uh, but also of course uh, being worked on closely with Dr. Shahab's office as well as the Saskatchewan Health Authority um, so that it is very clear uh, when we do get to a date that we can open up um, our restaurants, gyms, uh, the other uh, businesses associated with phase three, uh, that we'll be able to do so in a, in a very safe manner. Next question from the phone line. We have Murray Mendrick with the Leader Post. Good afternoon, Mr. Premier. Uh, as you know, on the weekend, we heard the story that the uh, mayor's office received uh, 
uh, a bomb threat related to uh, the picket line at uh, the co-op refinery aimed at Unifor uh, workers. We also know that this uh, week Unifor is going to set up picket lines more in rural Saskatchewan as an informational basis, but that will add conflict between perhaps farmers and strikers, or sorry, my apologies, uh, labour people that are, on, uh, uh, are, are, are locked out. Uh, what is, needs to be done in terms of public safety to ensure both the safety of farmers and certainly uh, uh, the uh, people that might be out picketing the, the people with, with uniform who uh, were subjected to this uh, threat last February? Okay, so the, yeah, the, the threat, I learned of that when I read uh, it in the newspaper this weekend as well. Um, since then, I've been informed uh, just today um, that the, there was a copy that was uh, circulated to the Attorney General's office, of which he immediately passed on to the RCMP. Um, and uh, that is uh, very unfortunate uh, and, and alarming that there is a, a threat um, such as that. But I uh, will leave that in our, our law enforcement uh, authorities' hands. Uh, with respect to um, picketing um, that, that may occur in, in various areas of the province, this is uh, Unifor's uh, right uh, to have uh, illegal, illegal uh, picket lines. Um, but I would caution them from crossing the line uh, in, in, uh, to what would be illegal picket lines, which we have seen uh, over the course of the last number of months, uh, most notably right here in Regina. Um, so if uh, the, the effort and the intent is to, uh, you know, legally um, communicate their message to individuals across the province, I think that is, uh, um, that, that, that is legal and that is their right to do so. But I would uh, most certainly caution uh, members to not uh, venture into what is deemed uh, not legal or illegal. And I'm sure they will. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm certain uh, they will. These are, uh, you know, neighbours of, of many uh, here in the community of Regina and, and the surrounding communities, and, and they want to go back to work. Um, so that is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain they will do the right thing, communicate their message, uh, but not cross that line. Follow up, Murray? Do you not see uh, the province having a role in public safety? Obviously, in, in the case of yourself, you had to increase your security detail uh, this year for public safety issues. There are similarities, uh, I guess, in terms of, of making sure that everyone, I guess, is safe in this particular circumstances when nerves are frayed and such. And also, in relation to farmers being a little frustrated, uh, there may now be uh, there may now be the issue of U.S. not accepting. Uh, Canadian beef, and I'm wondering if you could also comment as to whether uh, this is sort of a viable concern right now, or if it's something that you're going to have to just watch play out. Um, with respect to public safety, I'm sure there'll be recommendations that would be made either by the Regina Police Services or or uh, or the RCMP to any credible threats that may come to individuals or an organization. That's why we have law enforcement uh, here in this city and across the province. Uh, with respect to the comments uh, that were made earlier around. Uh, um, providing uh, Canadian beef uh, into the U.S. Uh, we have such an integrated, such an integrated economy, and it's even more so when it comes to agri-food products. And I, I just don't know that that would even really be possible for any length of time uh, to to not allow um, agri-food products to move agri-food products as well as agri-food production materials to move north and south uh, across the border. We have potash in Saskatchewan, we make some nitrogen here, but we bring phosphate in uh, from Florida, for example. We bring in tractors, uh, drills, well, tractors and combines uh, from the U.S. We send uh, drills and oats uh, back down to the U.S. as well as, uh, as, well as uh, um, uh, live cattle. Um, some packaged be meat, uh, beef and, and pork, um, but we also sell uh, send a significant amount of pork uh, down to the U.S. So uh, amidst the musings, what I heard uh, of the president today was uh, some musings around uh, they have too many uh, livestock, live livestock in the U.S. and, and limiting uh, some of the beef um, that would be coming into the U.S. but would exempt for sure uh, any allies, which I would count Canada among the very closest allies. So. We have a very integrated economy, whether it be uh, agri-food products, energy, or, or other products, and, and most certainly, as we look to recover from, uh, from COVID-19 from a North American perspective, I think we need to, uh, yes, uh, have very serious and conversations around the security 
of our border from a health care perspective and the, from the spread of the virus perspective, but just a serious conversations around uh, not only our provincial borders but our U.S. border to ensure uh, that we are allowing uh, a reasonable amount of trade so that our economies jointly can equally can, can recover. We'll take our next question from the phone line. We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, uh, you announced the uh, expanded testing will come fairly soon. I'm wondering when it, when it will roll out, how it will be run. Uh, for example, will people still need a referral if they want to get a test? So maybe I can make some initial comments and then Scott, maybe if you wanted to add to that. So some of the recommendations are being worked through in terms of how that will flow. For example, uh, Scott may speak to uh, some of the testing that may be offered to, for example, patients who are uh, going to start chemotherapy, for example. But certainly, um, I checked the self-assessment algorithm uh, just yesterday. I think that includes a broader symptom list, which is national and international recommendations. And um, But I think the, really the onus is on people themselves to come forward, knowing that you know coughs and colds are few and far between in the spring and summer months. But even if you have that scratch or a cough, um, I, I, and you may be fine or after a few days, but testing informs you in terms of do you need to just stay home a bit longer to make sure that you don't infect others as you go about uh, in our reopen Saskatchewan plan. It also informs your close contacts to just uh, you know stay home for a bit. And I think so. Testing is important not just for yourself and your family's health, but you know for us all of us. You know it, it helps all of us uh, reopen in a safe manner. And so it's just re really just reemphasizing the importance of testing not just in terms of you know, informing your own uh, symptoms, but also in, um, informing the broader community in terms of how much COVID activity uh, we actually have. Uh, having said that, the fact that we have very low number of hospitalizations uh, as well, which has a three to four week lag from case numbers, is also reinforces the fact that we have fairly low COVID activity and that's where we want to keep it. But you know, maintaining uh, testing at a reasonable level, uh, which, uh, at the moment, it's it's appropriate, but again, certainly, if there's opportunities to increase that a bit, uh, where, especially where people have symptoms and are just thinking of should they go for testing or not, just making it easier for people to get te uh, go for testing, I think, is important just to maintain that testing level and that um, kind of reassurance that uh, we are maintaining COVID-19 circulation in the in the in the community at a very low level. Scott, if you, do, would you have anything to add further on the testing policy at, at, as it's going to unfold? Just to add to what you've already said is that the, the group is working through that expanded capacity this week and what's relevant this week as well as the reopening of the healthcare system and to Dr. Shaw's point, one of the targeted areas that we're looking at is immunocompromised folks, those folks that don't have uh, immune systems that would fight viruses or bacteria or anything else as well as others, including cancer patients and other folks. The other thing to your question is how will folks access it? It's another thing we're looking at is how do you how do you expand that accessibility and, and how uh, some of our physicians have asked us the same questions is how will we move forward in ordering tests because those tests are now done under the order of a single physician and reported out through medical health officers. But if we're going to open it up, we also need to make sure that those folks ordering tests know exactly where and how to, to get access for their patients to get swabs and ordered those tests for them. But it'll evolve over this week and will be starting to be implemented as we have opened up the healthcare system this week. Follow up, Adam? Yeah, I'm wondering on uh, the business reopening, is there any consequence for businesses that don't follow public health recommendations? Can they be fined? Is it going to be based on um, people complaining from the public or uh, is the government going to be monitoring, uh, making checks, or following up on things? How's that going to work? I'll, uh, I'll maybe begin to answer that. If anyone else wants to step in, either Dr. Shahab or, uh, or Scott, uh, uh, feel free. But I, I would say first and foremost, um, no one is out looking to find people for not adhering to the public health uh, recommendations, uh, for sure the recommendations or the orders that are in place. Um, any visits that would come would in many cases be um, complaint driven. Um, and would be to communicate uh, the fact that there is a public health order in place and to communicate uh, to the individuals involved that uh, they're very clearly in, in violation if they are and that they should change uh, whatever they're doing. If, if they refuse to change uh, and over a period of time, um, then there is the opportunity to, to, uh, to administer 
fines uh, in, in, uh, to, to those individuals that may choose not to. This has not been our experience in the province uh, over the course of the last two months. Our experience, I think, uh, has been quite different where there has been some uh, violations, if you will, of the public health order that uh, A, the individuals were aware that they were actually in violation of a public health order, or B, uh, we've been able to work with the individuals or the broader group um, to come up with some standards that would allow the, the, uh, the event, the whatever is happening to occur, but to occur in a safe manner with uh, appropriate physical distancing recommendations and, and, uh, and parameters around it. So the, the intent is always to work uh, with the individuals or the group of individuals on, uh, you know, on, on ensuring they are aware of what the public health orders are. And then uh, second, uh, if, if it is something that does wish to continue, that we work together to find a way for it to occur safely. Um, and if we're not able to do that, the, the fines or charging is uh, the absolute last resort. We'll take our next question from the phone line. We have Dan Jones with NBC. Yeah, good afternoon, Dr. Shahab. In terms of lifting the travel restrictions in the northwest part of the province, what would you have to see in order to make that happen? So generally for outbreaks, we do like to see case numbers extremely low. They may not be zero, but extremely low for at least two weeks. And secondly, uh, even if uh, when the case numbers are low, if most of them are linked to a known case, then those two factors demonstrate that there's no ongoing widespread community transmission. Um, and obviously, so case numbers have to be going down, first of all, which they are coming down, but then case numbers continue to uh, need to continue to remain low and for the fo uh, most part be linked to known uh, cases. And that's what we've seen with the effort that communities in the Northwest have put in themselves, uh, local leadership, uh, people living in the Northwest, and then um, you know uh, 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 SHA staff working there and additional staff who were deployed. They've all, all managed to you know uh, overcome the outbreak. And most cases now are really cases who were contacts of previous cases, and they have no further contacts. So they were isolated as contacts, and uh, the few who, who presented as cases had no further contacts to be followed up. And that's how you uh, go towards a, a situation where. We hope that if we see very few cases over the next two to three weeks um, in the Northwest and, and uh, the few that do occur have uh, uh, known uh, exposure to a known case, those would all be uh, indications for gradually relaxing um, the restrictions in the Northwest. Follow up, Dan? Uh, yes. Uh, Premier, can you expand on the clarity that was given to uh, people, uh, leaders and checkpoint staff in the Northwest as to what uh, they can do to obtain essential goods and services when traveling uh, to the south? Uh, with what clarity was given to the conservation officers, uh, public safety officers, uh, the locals that were at the checkpoints? That's the question. Still there, Dan? Yes, I am. Okay, is that the question on what clarity was given to them on e what is essential, what is not? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd, I'd have to get uh, Minister Carr or Marlo, Marlo um, Pritchard to follow up with you with specifically uh, what uh, uh, was classified as essential, what was not. I know uh, there were some sensitivities around this um, in the in the early days of the province uh, operating uh, the checkpoints um, and the goal was quite frankly to limit travel to just essential services between communities and and uh, in and out of uh, of the northern areas of the province. Um, I, I believe that through uh, conversations with uh, community leaders, uh, both, as I say, Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous, that uh, many of those uh, challenges have been worked through. Uh, it's not to say that there still isn't uh, going to be some, um, but I'm not aware of them at this point in time. And it, with respect to what uh, exact um, uh, clarification or, or direction was given, uh, that would be a question best for Marlo Reynolds. I can have him follow, or Marlo, uh, Pritchard. Uh, Marlo Pritchard, pardon me. Uh, he can follow up uh, with you on on that specific question as to where they began and where they uh, evolved to today. We'll take our next question from the phone line. We have Adriana Christensen with CJME. Uh, yes, this question is for um, Scott Livingstone. 
there have been concerns raised by individuals in the public um, about the um, basically the health care visiting policy, uh, especially in the South. Um, the question is basically why there couldn't be um, some safety measures in place to allow a single support person um, to visit some, a patient in the hospital. Okay. So thank you for that question. And as you know, <coughs> through public health order, there, there was a restriction on visiting to all healthcare facilities, not just hospitals, but also long-term care. And in particular mm -hmm. for long-term care and hospitalized patients, it was done to protect those patients. Today, um, I was actually on a call with the uh, Patient and Family Leadership Council for the organization. And we also have a subgroup of folks working with one of the team members from our AOC on exactly what you said is how do we, you know, we've been under lockdown for a number of weeks. We've heard a lot from uh, caregivers, from family, from loved ones. Um, you know, we tried to open it up a little bit on Mother's Day with gifts, but we are hearing lots about the concerns that family have, and we are working on a new and revised structure to start opening that up. We don't have it yet. Uh, as we've opened up the healthcare system, we'd like a little bit of time to see what that has uh, with respect to an impact on our COVID cases, but we are working on it and you will likely see over the upcoming weeks a phased in plan suggestion for not just hospitalized patients, but even looking at some of those folks in long-term care, particularly those folks with dementia uh, and uh, neurological disorders that are, seem to be struggling more than others. Uh, but we are hearing from our um, clients, residents and families, and uh, it's, uh, you know, we all have moms and dads as well. Uh, across this province in, in these types of situations. So we are working on something. We just haven't uh, brought it to the table yet with those groups, but we are using patients and family advisors to guide this work. Follow up, Adriana? Um, I guess, uh, no, that's, that, that answers my question. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just add to that, Adriana. Uh, Scott's right. We, we all have family members that are either in uh, long-term care, have been, or or maybe many of us are, are heading there at some point. Uh, this is uh, the, the fact that we have had not had uh, widespread COVID-19 infections in our long-term care homes uh, is the main reason why uh, we have had almost 600, 599 cases here in the province with a very low uh, fatality rate. And I, I feel for each and every one of those families that has a loved one that they have been unable to see, and I commend uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority for working uh, through some way for us to uh, have the proper precautions in place so that that may happen, um, so that they, family members can see uh, their loved one. And this is one of the most challenging um, items, I think, that we have been working through, uh, both at a government level, as, but we're all individuals as well, throughout this process is when you do have a loved one either in hospital or in a long-term care facility and you're unable to see them outside from through a, a glass window. But it is a large reason uh, that we have been successful with our low number of fatalities. We, um, you know, across this nation, 82% of the fatalities have occurred in, in long-term care homes. 90% of the fatalities are, are individuals, uh, I believe over 60 or 65 uh, years of age. Uh, this is where this virus is is discriminant uh, in how it impacts uh, our community's elderly, our family's elderly, and, uh, and and our loved ones. So, I commend the Saskatchewan Health Authority for making efforts to allow uh, some degree of support and visits uh, to occur. Um, but I also am fully aware that, albeit how how very difficult this decision is, um, it is speaks to what would be a much more difficult situation in having a very large number of fatalities coming out of our long-term care homes. And we don't have that right now. And for that, I am forever grateful. Arthur. Um, so, um, we haven't heard anything from you today about plans to potentially reopen the legislature. Um, and today is, of course, the day that the NDP set as a, uh, a deadline for doing so, or at least informing them about plans. Can you update about us about the state of those negotiations and just explain what, from your perspective, the sticking point is in reaching an agreement? Well, I, I'll, uh, I will be having some discussions about this uh, as government uh, in, in, over the course of the next day or two uh, to look at what options uh, that we could put forward to uh, not only introduce a budget here in the House, but to actually pass a budget uh, here in the House and to have that budget have uh, 
uh, legislative scrutiny, uh, the legislative scrutiny that it deserves. Um, the offer that was put forward of uh, 28 sitting days isn't happening anywhere else in the nation. I think when you add up all of the legislative sitting days since uh, provinces and territories have entered into a state of emergency, I think that might be collectively about 20 or 20, 25 or 30 uh, sitting days. Um, and most of those um, uh, daily proceedings, if you will, have been vastly altered. The intent of, uh, of most of those sitting days has been to pass very specific pieces of legislation uh, in certain jurisdictions, uh, legislation that is required so that they can um, put in place uh, some restrictions or some laws uh, very specific to the, the emergency orders uh, that they have in that respective uh, province uh, or territory. So we've been very specific. There's been uh, far fewer uh, routine proceedings, for instance, like question period, things uh, like that across the nation. So we're, we're looking at uh, uh, what's been happening uh, across Canada in other legislative assemblies and and uh, we'll we'll put forward uh, we'll have we'll have some options uh, that we'll put forward to ultimately, um, with the intent of tabling and and passing a budget here. Staff. So, uh, what's the holdup on the port part of your government? Because it seems like the NDP are willing to do pretty much anything to get some kind of budget debate happening, whether it's Zoom or or reduce people in the House here. So, what's the holdup on on the part of your government? And if not 28 sitting days, what's that number you're looking at? Well, that's what we're going to have a discussion about as government uh, in the next day or two, and we'll put forward an option. And if the NDP uh, do truly want to, uh, we'll do just about anything uh, to have some legislative scrutiny of a budget. They'll accept the offer that we put there, and we'll move forward to. Together. Thanks very much for joining us today, everyone. That's all the time that we have.